So George H.W. Bush passed away a few days ago. Um, and what I want to do is, is take a little bit of time here and go through his legacy in detail. Now, uh, you know, when somebody dies, it's the common courtesy thing to do to never say anything negative about that person. But I have to say that overall I have mixed feelings about that rule. Because on the one hand, I do feel like there's something instinctual about that, or for whatever reason, at a base level, everybody kind of winces and cringes if you start talking uh, negatively of the recently deceased. And I totally get that. Um, but also, this is a political figure, so his actual policy agenda, it, it matters to keep that in perspective and to give all the information about it, because... Um, if you pretend like it's all positive, well, that has implications for the future. And uh, I just, I, I honestly, looking at what happened in mainstream media and how they're covering it, it is a little bit sickening because all of a sudden it's wall-to-wall -wall fawning coverage. I mean, saying things, honestly, that were laughable for when he was president and directly after he was president. Like, for example, he was kind of famous for being like a cold dude who had no sense of humor, but now every article is like, he had the most wonderful sense of humor. So it's just over the top with the praise. Now, on the other hand, while mainstream media is falling all over itself to say nothing but glowing positive things about him, uh, I also have seen, just because I'm, you know, the Twitter circles I run in, <laughs> it's, it's like the opposite, where it's everybody, you know, saying, fuck him, uh, he's a war criminal. Uh, he deserves to rot in hell and all that stuff. And I, I do have competing um, competing emotions whenever somebody dies who I'm not that fond of in terms of their policy agenda. Because, again, on the one hand, you feel like it's it's the basic, decent human thing to do to not shit on the recently deceased. But when all you get is fake praise, honestly, uh, in mainstream circles, you leave people no choice but to give you also the downsides of said person's legacy. And it's funny because I feel like there are a bunch of people who agree with me in my mixed emotions uh, when it comes to somebody like this dying, but um, it's funny to see how hardcore some people are in the two respective camps. Like, some people will say you're the worst person ever if you utter any negative thing, no matter how true it is, after somebody dies. They'll despise you with every fiber of their being. But then other people will treat you like some sort of a sellout if for just having that natural human thing of like, I don't like shitting on the recently deceased. And of course, the first thing they go to is like, oh yeah? What about Hitler? Congratulations, what a, what a genius you are that you, <laughs> that you brought that up as a counterpoint. It's not a, it's never about the individual. It's more about just a principled stance against harm, against pain being inflicted, against death. It's the idea that, you know, if you're on the left and if you are a humanitarian, you don't really wish anything negative even on your worst enemies. But anyway, so let's start with the positive. Um, now, the first one, and this is so trivial as to I, I barely even, you know... This barely made the cut for me to mention it because it's so trivial and it's such a low bar. But that letter that he left to Bill Clinton when he was talking about, you know, hey, this is uh, part of our democracy and it's the, ch uh, the peaceful transition of power. And when I walked through that Oval Office door, I felt a sense of awe that that was the case four years ago. And that's also the case now. Um, so if you read that letter, and I'm not going to go through it all here, but if you read that letter, it actually is really nice. It's just like a nice, warm thing for a human being to write to another human being. It's very gracious after losing an election. Um, and I don't know if, if I agree with the people who say, well, that's an era now that's dead and gone, and it's such an example of what politics used to be wonderful in the United States, and now it's terrible. I don't know about all that. Uh, and again, I'll get to H.W. Bush's negative soon, and you'll see it wasn't all roses. <laughs> but... There was something about that letter that was just like, oh, that's that, that was nice. That was a nice letter he wrote. 
Now, I'm generally a, a, a skeptical, uh, cynical bastard, but yeah, when I read that letter, I was like, oh, that's a sweet letter that he left him. So go check that out if you haven't. If you type in, you know, George H.W. Bush's letter to Bill Clinton, you'll you'll read it and you'll go, oh, yeah, that actually is pretty nice. At least if you're not, you know, <laughs> if you're somehow even more skeptical slash cynical than me, which I think is hard to get there, but some people are, then maybe you'll be like, ah, fuck this. But I think most people read that and they go, oh, that's a nice letter. Um... Now, the other thing is, another positive thing is, he did kind of oversee the actual end of the Cold War. That's lovely. Now, we could, of course, go into the details of, you know, uh, how it happened and whether or not it was fair and um, every single nook and cranny of how it unfolded. And I do think there's a lot to criticize there, but it's generally understood as a positive thing that, okay, well, it was the end of the Cold War and... Getting away from the brink of uh, nuclear destruction is always a good thing. So you can give them a little check mark in the positive section for that. Um, some stuff that people don't know, which is positive, is he actually loathed um, the far right's economic ideology. And as a Republican president, it's um, that is kind of unique because everybody from Reagan and onward totally drank the Kool-Aid and they're brainwashed into just a factually wrong... Um, interpretation and perception of reality when it comes to economics. And George H.W. Bush did not hesitate to say, I think that's bullshit. Um, in fact, he called it voodoo economics, trickle-down economics, of course. It's Reaganomics. And he was Reagan's VP. But what happened was uh, there was a recession when Reagan got out of office. Um, and it, it was George H.W. Bush who followed Reagan so there was a recession, and George H.W. Bush knew that it was attributable to Reagan's um, economic philosophy, basically cutting taxes on the rich massively and uh, deregulating at the same time. And he literally called it voodoo economics. He said, this is not, like, this doesn't work. And also, uh, for people on the right who are actually deficit hawks, well, you have to pick one. You either can believe in trickle-down economics or you can believe in deficit reduction. You can't have both because historically, when you do trickle-down economics, it explodes the debt and the deficit. And, you know, George H.W. Bush famously said, uh, read my lips, no new taxes when he ran for president. And then he raised taxes when he became president. And, you know, his argument was, yeah, that was me when I was campaigning. That was campaign mode. But now that I'm president, I see that I have to raise it and it would be a terrible thing not to raise taxes because I think it'll lead to more harm if I don't raise taxes. So we raise taxes, and then many people point to that as one of the many reasons why he ended up losing re-election to Bill Clinton in 1992. So the fact that he was against trickle-down economics, I mean, there's a case to be made that he literally is one of maybe the last, you know, prominent Republican who was against a far-right economic uh, approach. Um, but certainly, at the very least, one of, you know, just a handful of people on the right who are against this far-right uh, economic approach. So credit where it's due on that front. It's a really low bar because trickle-down economics is obviously ridiculous. But still, I mean, the fact that he recognized that and he was able to um, digest and accept that reality means he's less of an ideologue than almost the entire Republican Party is today. Um... The other thing is, he was advised to kill Saddam Hussein by top people in his administration and basically overthrow the Iraqi government. And he said no. And his argument was, as any reasonable person would say, okay, so you overthrow Saddam Hussein and then what? What comes next? What's going to happen? Chances are, um, we're going to make the situation worse and there's going to be blowback. And it's not our place to do it. So... Now, he was an interventionist, and I'm going to get to more specifics on that in a second in the negative section, but um, certainly not as bad as the hardcore neocons, the Dick Cheney's, the Donald Rumsfeld's, uh, people like that, and of course Dick Cheney was in his administration, but he kind of reined in the, the worst wing of that philosophy. Again, low bar, but I think it's important to say that they wanted him to overthrow Saddam, and he said, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, and then probably what I think is the best part of his legacy is, and this is something you'll never hear on corporate media, he actually stood up to Israel. 
Um, and he was arguably the last president to really do so. I mean, Obama on the way out the door gave him a little slap on the wrist when the U.S. abstained um, on or basically a resolution to say, hey, the illegal settlements are bad and wrong and you probably shouldn't do them. Now, there was no force behind this resolution anyway, but um, the fact that the U.S. always votes with Israel and then on the way out the door, they were like, we're going to abstain because obviously we know these illegal settlements are terrible and wrong, so we're just going to not vote on it and basically lend credence to the global community who says, hey, Israel, stop it. So that was the furthest that uh, Obama went. But of course, he get billions of dollars worth of subsidies and and he didn't really do much to fight back against the far right in Israel. Um, but George H.W. Bush rejected $10 billion in loan guarantees to Israel unless they froze their settlements. So, And this is just a small example of stuff that can be done if you actually have leadership in the U.S. that's willing to stand up to Israel. Now, granted, overall, that's a minor thing because really what we need to do is go much further in our crackdown on Israel to try to bring about a peace deal and get Palestinians their human rights. But he was the last president to do anything really substantive and tangible to stand up to Israel. Rejected $10 billion in loan guarantees unless they froze their settlements. So I thought that was really important. Now, that's all the positive stuff. The negative stuff is very negative. Again, I hate to do this right after the guy passes away, but we have to keep the actual policy agenda in perspective so that we don't do these things moving forward. If all you do is glorify, uh, you know, U.S. statesmen after they die, well then, like, I mean, come on. What about George W. Bush? What about Dick Cheney? And they're probably going to do it with those guys too. But that is a, a tacit endorsement of everything that they did in office. And that shows to the world that we actually do really want to worship war criminals. And that says something terrible about us. It's almost like the state religion is fundamentalist in nature and it overrides the reality of what these people did in office. So, uh, first of all, he literally lied to get us into Operation Desert Storm, which was, uh, you know, they said to protect Kuwaiti oil fields from an Iraqi invasion. Um, and... The famous lie, the worst lie, was they said that um, babies were being pulled out of incubators. The Iraqis were pulling babies out of incubators and letting them die on the floor. And they had somebody testify in front of Congress about that. And, of course, come to find out, this was basically a paid actress. Like, the lies, it was really some wag-the-dog type shit. For those of you who haven't seen that movie, go check out that movie and you'll get the reference. But, like, it was just flat-out... Like, we're going to have to lie about this um, so that we can do a, a massive propaganda effort to get us into the, into the Middle East more, to get us to fight this war, because if you just tell the American people what's really going on, there's no way they'll support it. Because in reality, this had more to do with, um, you know, the oil fields. And Bill Moyers had a great article on this, and it goes into detail about how... Um, so... Yes, Saddam's invasion of Kuwait was wrong and illegal and you shouldn't have done it. But there actually is a very complicated backstory involving um, Kuwait keeping their oil prices super low on purpose, which was collapsing the Iraqi economy. Saddam had repeatedly asked Kuwait, hey, listen, you, gotta, you can't keep the oil prices this artificially low because it's totally destroying our economy. And that's a problem. And then also on top of that, Kuwait started to do these tricks when they um, were drilling for their oil, where they would go sideways and into Iraqi territory. So Saddam argued, listen, me going into Kuwait is me uh, effectively being defensive because they're stealing our natural resources and they're tanking our economy on purpose when I repeatedly asked them they can't keep their oil prices artificially low. So, and again, that's not to say it's okay because the invasion was still illegal and wrong, but it's a complicated backstory. And what we wanted to do um, was go in on the side of our closer ally. The other thing is, they were building this case for um, war against Saddam, but remember, we had backed Saddam before that, and he was an ally of ours before that. At the height of his atrocities against the Kurds, we were giving him arms, we were giving him money. So, it's, it was so... It, it honestly was ridiculous. Anybody who was following it closely, you knew... Like, okay, this is bullshit. You don't care about Saddam's, uh, you know, 
humanitarian record. You were just aiding the worst parts of it, like we do now with Saudi Arabia as they do a genocide in Yemen. This idea that it's like, oh my god, he's so bad to people. Yeah, you knew that, and you were arming him and giving him money, and you were an ally with him at the height of his atrocities. So in other words, it was a purposeful propaganda effort to lie us into a war. Now, people generally say, oh my god, that war was a success, but that's because we went, got in and got out, so people thought like, oh, okay, at least it ended. Which is good, but it was based on false pretenses. And people don't talk about it like that. They just compare it to George W. Bush, who brought us into the endless war in Iraq and endless wars in the Middle East, and they go, oh, at least H.W., you know, got us home and got us home quickly. Again, but it was based on lies. So uh, that's the first thing that's just inexcusable. Then, um... The U.S. dropped a whopping 88,500 tons of bombs on Iraq and Iraqi-occupied Kuwait. 88,500 tons of bombs. And then they bombed an air raid shelter on purpose, and they killed over 400 civilians in the process. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. Bombing an air raid shelter on purpose, killing over 400 civilians. That's the definition of terrorism. They killed, they, they attacked civilians, and they did it on purpose for a political reason, for a strategic reason in a war. Attacked civilians, killed civilians on purpose. Again, over 400 of them at an air raid shelter. Listen, on that alone, they shouldn't be, you know, heaping fawning praise on this guy. I'm sorry. Doesn't mean you can't discuss, like, some of the positive things that I laid out there. But it does mean you can't pretend like he never did anything wrong. That is literally terrorism. And I know it's totally politically incorrect for somebody to talk about these things right after somebody died, but you give people no choice when all you do is fluff pieces. You leave people no choice because we have to get all the facts out there. Um, the other thing is they bombed electricity generating and uh, water treatment facilities and food processing plants, and flour mills. So in other words, they bombed civilian infrastructure on purpose, which is a war crime. So he is a war criminal, literally. So unacceptable. The Iran-Contra the Iran, uh, affair, that was the scandal where uh, the U.S. traded missiles for American hostages in Iran, and then they used the proceeds of those arms sales to fund Contra rebels in Nicaragua. The Iran-Contra scandal was huge. Um, well, what H.W. did is he pardoned pretty much everybody who was involved with that because, of course, he was in the Reagan administration and others in the Reagan administration. They were the ones who, uh, who did this, who facilitated this. So he pardoned six people who were tried and found guilty. Now, that's a super important fact because what you see is people are saying, oh, my God, George H.W. Bush, he was back when Republican presidents were serious. And Donald Trump is not serious. And it's like, hey, asshole, the thing that they're afraid of with the Mueller investigation, like, oh my God, what if, uh, you know, Donald Trump starts pardoning everybody who Mueller knocks off, whether it be Manafort or Flynn or his kids at some point or Kushner. It's like, yeah, Trump might pardon them, but it's not like there's no precedent for this. George H.W. Bush did that with the people in the Iran-Contra affair. So it's like... He was pretty bad. I mean, I, I don't know how else you want me to describe that. When you pardon people who were involved in a criminal conspiracy, when you were in the administration that was also involved in the criminal conspiracy, perhaps that shouldn't be allowed. You know, there, there should be a rule that any, uh, you know, trial where you can, you could testify potentially, you shouldn't be allowed to pardon them if you're a president. Because that really gets close to the point of saying, we have an emperor, we have a dictator, we don't have r rule of law and... You know, you can basically get away with your own crimes if so you want. And it's like the debate happening nowadays where people are like, maybe Trump can pardon himself. No, he can't. No, he can't. If he were to do that, I hope it goes through the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says, are you fucking crazy? That undercuts our entire civilization. That gets rid of, you know, the Enlightenment. That makes it so that we don't have a system of government checks and balances anymore. But yeah, H.W. Bush pardoned people who did a criminal conspiracy where he potentially played a role in it. Totally unacceptable. Um, also, he escalated the war on drugs. And the way in which he did it was really 
really fucked up. So there's this famous story of him holding up crack uh, cocaine, giving an address in the Oval Office, talking to the American people, and he claimed in the address, like, oh, this was bought outside of the White House. That's how bad this crack epidemic is. You could literally walk outside of the White House and, and buy crack. Um, but what actually happened was the U.S. government lured in and had to try repeatedly before they could get it done, but they lured in a 19-year-old kid who then sold the crack, and then later on, they uh, tracked him down, tried him, I think, on, on, a different, uh, on a different drug case, I think, and they gave him 10 years in prison. So they literally, and then they floated it to HW to pardon him. He was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, you want to talk about entrapment. They, they bring this poor kid in, buy crack cocaine from him, and then throw him in prison for 10 years. And he didn't care that he just ruined somebody's life. But honestly, that's just one example. That's symbolic of how many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives that were ruined because he escalated the drug war. So again, you can't celebrate these things. And then finally, the sanctions that were put on Iraq, um, according to the United Nations, killed over 500,000 children. So we put sanctions on them, and it led to the death of over 500,000 children, according to the UN. You, you have to not be brainwashed state media. And I say this to CNN, I say this to MSNBC, I say this to Fox News. But that's what they're doing, and that's how they're acting. Now, again, just like I said at the beginning of this segment, I get it. I actually struggle with that normal human sentiment of, like, don't say anything negative about somebody who recently died. That does feel like it's, it's like, anti-humanist. Like, it's you saying, I don't have a principled stance against other people feeling pain and suffering and death and all that stuff. And I do feel like I have a principled stance against those things. So, I do struggle with that. But, again, you leave people no choice when all you do is fawning praise. And I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not the type of person where I'm going to sit here and, you know, be happy at some, be joyful over somebody's demise. But what I will say is, um, I'm not exactly crying at the moment. <laughs> I'm not crying. And it's a damn shame that you're not allowed to be nuanced and objective in your analysis of a political figure after they pass away, because this is more than just a private citizen. This is somebody whose who's life impacted millions of other people. And to pretend like that's not the case is honestly journalistic malpractice. So... While I am uncomfortable with the people on the left who might literally be joyful over anybody's death, um, I also am by no stretch of the imagination a fan of the fawning establishment press that whitewashes the real legacy after a, a top political figure passes away. So all of the facts matter, all of the information matters, and that doesn't change because somebody's no longer with us. So hopefully this segment was instructive uh, and you learned something. And listen, the next time another top political figure passes away and the establishment media does the same thing, I'm going to have to respond in the same way and give you all of the data because that's more important than anybody's feelings.